All right. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salat salam ala Rasulullah. Uh, today we have uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Murad Sharfawi, who has a very long experience in high-tech companies in Canada and US, and he has also teaching experience. So I think we are very lucky to have him today. Currently, he's working at uh, Amazon. Uh, his main uh, concentration is on cloud computing and uh, security. As you know, security uh, these days is very, very important topic. So, inshallah, we are going to benefit from him. Please, for the audience, uh, try to keep your microphone off at all time. Uh, wait, uh, you can ask question. You should ask at least one question. كل واحد منكم إذا يحب يأخذ the certificate في النهاية لازم يسأل على الأقل سؤال واحد. بس الأجوبة راح تكون إن شاء الله في نهاية ال ال presentation. In order to get certificate, you have, as I said, you have to ask one question. لازم تسأل سؤال على الأقل. بعدين في formula that the administrator is going to put on the chat. You have to fill it. Make sure to write a correct email and the correct name of your university. That's all what we need. We don't need a lot of information. Uh, Dr. Murad, please try to keep the presentation to uh, 45 minutes to have a chance at the end to, uh, to have questions and answers. So please, you can start. Thank you, Dr. Harus. Uh, Salam alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, presentation. Uh, so my presentation today will be about uh, data protection. It's actually an introduction to data protection because as you will see, there is a lot of content there, uh, but hopefully we will introduce uh, the, more in, the, more in, the most important uh, concepts in, in data protection. Okay, I, can, I think I can skip... Uh, this slide because I was already introduced. So first, why is it important to protect data? Because data is ultimately what we care most about in computing. When we do computing, when we use computers or computers, computer systems, the most important things for, for users is, is the data. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that it is protected. And it's also data is, uh, most of the time, hackers, that's the target of, of hackers. They, they want to get access to your data uh, and, and steal it or have access to it or use it in malicious ways. Um, now, compromised data, if the data is compromised or stolen, it can result in financial reputation and business losses. Uh, there are many companies actually that, uh, that uh, lost uh, reputation, lost, uh, lost money, as a result of, uh, of, uh, of data breaches. Okay, so when we talk about data, uh, what kind of data are we interested in? So some of the data that you see here on this slide is uh, uh, um, uh, something we think about immediately, like passwords, right, or, or keys. Uh, these are things that are that, uh, that we all want to protect. We don't want uh, uh, someone malicious to have access to them. But there are also other data that, that, kind of, that are uh, also important. Like for example, your banking data, uh, your uh, uh, health information data. Um, and there are other things that we, we don't think a lot about. Like for example, intellectual property inventions, right? Like if you have an invention, we, we want to protect it. We don't want someone to, to have access to it and have, and have uh, the benefit or the merit for, for that invention. Uh, source code can, can, be, uh, can, can be important data. We don't think of source code like a program in a programming language as, uh, as, as important data, but it can be data if, it's, if, if the source code is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is something that we want to protect. Another thing is trade secret. Uh, trade secret, like think of, for example, like products like Coca-Cola or Selecto in Algeria. Uh, yeah, they have, these are products that kind of have, have their trade secrets and they don't want to, uh, 
uh, anyone to have access to them. So this should be protected. State secrets also. Uh, state secrets are like strategic, anything that is strategic to, to a country, for, in, for, uh, for a country that we don't, that uh, the country doesn't want uh, enemies to have access to, right? Uh, and lastly, uh, pers personally identify information. So this is like things like your uh, passport number, for example, or, uh, or uh, the uh, identity, national identity number, or, or uh, uh, username, uh, or sorry, uh, first name, last name, uh, date of birth. This, this is also information that we don't want uh, malicious actors to have access to. Okay. So when do we need to protect data? So now that we have reviewed the kind of data that we want to, to protect, uh, when the question is, when do we need to protect it? Okay. So first, we need to protect it when the data is at rest. Basically, at rest means that the data is stored uh, typically on disk, right? Uh, so and uh, it, it can't even be used. It just, it's just they're sitting there. Uh, but it still needs to be protected because someone can has access to it, even physically can has access to, can get access to the computer or to the disk and steal the disk, right? Uh, another time we need to protect data is in motion. So what we mean by in data in motion is when you transfer data between two uh, between two uh, two locations. Like for example, when you access your bank information over the over the, the internet, right? So that's data in, in motion. When, or when uh, companies exchange information, that's data in motion. Uh, uh, hackers also can monitor the network and can access the data at that time. So it's important to access, to protect data in motion. And also in use. So what that means is that when the, the data is used in your program, I mean, in a, in a program, or it's, it's, uh, it's running in a, in a process, for example. So that's what we call data in use. So it's also important to protect the data when it's uh, when it's being used in uh, in Iraq, right? Okay. So we call these three situations the data states. So data can be in in a state of rest or in motion or in use. So it's very important to understand that these are th these three situations that uh, where data is used. So examples of data states. So at rest. When we say data at rest, we think uh, typically it's data that is stored in, in a file or on disk or in flash memory. Think, think about your cell phones, mobile phones. Uh, you have data that is stored in, in, uh, in, in flash memory uh, or data that is stored in a relational database, right? such as, such as uh, MySQL, or data that is stored in a cloud storage, that, such as uh, iCloud or, uh, or Google Drive. Uh, so th th this is what we call data. In this situation, the data would be at, at rest. Uh, in motion is that data exchanged when browsing the internet, for example, when we browse the internet, or even when we use media uh, applications like, such as uh, WhatsApp or Messenger or Skype, uh, uh, you would be exchanging data in the form of media, audio and video, right? And you want to protect also that, uh, that data. So in this situation, the data would be in motion. In use is when uh, information, spe especially sensitive information, is can contained in the memory space of applications in, in RAM, right? Uh, and uh, or web applications, um, but also uh, uh, in situations where the data is in what we call in memory data databases. These are databases that run in memory uh, and and uh, not are not uh, st stored in, in this, such as Redis or Memcache. D. Okay. Okay. So now that we have seen the data states, uh, so when we say data protection, what what do we mean exactly? So um, there are actually this, the goals of data protection can be can be summarized in this three letter, three letters CIA. So it's not the the agency, but it's rather uh, stands for C stands for confidentiality. E for I for integrity and A for availability, right? So if, if you look at uh, 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 security classes or security literature, in general, they will uh, 
say that when we talk about data protection, what we mean is, or security in general, we mean these three uh, aspects, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But, but lately, one other thing has been added, and which is very equally important, it's privacy. Uh, so hopefully, if we have a little time at the end, we'll talk about privacy as well. Okay. So first, confidentiality. What do, do we mean by confidentiality? So confidentiality is to ensure that data can only be accessed by those who have been granted access to it. That, that's confidentiality. You don't want your data to be accessed by, by anyone or to be viewed or seen by, by anyone who is not authorized. Uh, the most common technique when we speak about confidentiality, uh, we think uh, almost immediately about encryption. So uh, uh, cryptographic encryption is a technique to protect the confidentiality of data. Uh, it's, it's an important technique, but it's not the only one. Uh, and as we will see in the next slides, there are, there are other techniques to protect uh, confidentiality. So the second goal of data protection is integrity. So integrity basically, um, uh, uh, when we talk about integrity, we, refers to, to, we refer to three things. First, that data can only be modified by, by authorized parties. So people who are, or entities who are and, uh, authorized to, uh, to modify the data. Second, that modification are constrained by rules, that we can't change the data any way we want, right? And we will give examples. And third, uh, it must be possible to do, de de to detect unauthorized changes to the data. So if someone malicious, let's say a hacker, changes the data, it should be possible to, uh, to detect uh, that, uh, that change, right? Okay, what, what do we mean by modifications are constrained by rules? So let me give you an example. Like for example, let's say you're managing the database of, of, of users and they contain age, right? So if someone set, changes the age of a person in a database, such as the, the age is less than, let's see, zero, or more than 140, uh, that, that's not, that's not uh, uh, realistic, right? It's not, it's not consistent. Uh, so there should be rules that, that kind of uh, monitor this kind of, uh, of uh, or changes to the data so that they, they fall in, inside an acceptable uh, range. For example, that's an example for age, but you can think of other examples as well. Okay, and as we will see, uh, how do we detect unauthorized changes to the data? So we use a technique called signed hashes. We'll talk about it later. Uh, it's one technique that is used to, to detect uh, this specific uh, uh, scenario. Okay, the third thing, the third, uh, uh, data protection goal is availability. So availability is refers to the ability to ensure that data is always available when it's needed, right? So it's it's not only important to protect data against uh, malicious actors. We, we don't want them to view the data, uh, and we don't want them to change the data in an unauthorized way. But we also want to access our data when we want to, right? Uh, so common techniques to provide availability are backup archive. So like for any reason, think of the scenario where, for example, you kind of, uh, your hard drive uh, or disk crashes, right? If you have a backup of that data, then the data will be available, right? But if you don't have a backup, then, then you would basically lose the data. Uh, other techniques are redundancy scalability. We'll talk a little bit about those also early later. So for example, think of a scenario where you have a server where you're running a program like a web application, but there are so many to, or too many users, right? So if you, you want to access the, the data in that web application and there are too many users already, you might be uh, rejected uh, or your access might be declined, right? But if we somehow have the ability to, to scale that web application, then, you, then it should still be possible to access the data, even when there is a high traffic on, on that application. Okay, so uh, now we will introduce two matrices. The first one is the data states and CIA uh, uh, matrices, matrix. So as you can see, we have, uh, we have uh, on one side, we have the, the 
uh, on the left we have the data uh, states and on the top we have the, the, uh, the protection codes, right? And what we would see here are threat, threats examples. What, what kind of attacks, of cyber attacks can happen, uh, can happen when we combine these two uh, configuration. So we will not go in detail into kind of every scenario, uh, but, uh, but we'll go through some examples. For example, for let's take confidentiality and data at rest. Uh, so data at rest, when data at rest, uh, someone or uh, um, uh, so if someone guesses the user's password, uh, if you need, for example, a password to access your data that is that is stored on, on disk, if someone a hacker guesses the user's password, right, uh, then he could access the data. Uh, still in the database of the, of the, uh, of users that contains. Uh, uh, passwords uh, th that that should would be an attack on the data confidentiality when it is at rest. Uh, another simple example is, for example, someone uh, who steals student, a malicious or dishonest student who steals the exam from a professor's laptop. Uh, that's also an attack on confidentiality. Uh, let's take another example: uh, availability at rest. Right? Uh, what kind of attacks are possible? So one of them is a, a very popular nowadays is a ransomware. So a ransomware is a, a situation or a scenario where a hacker encrypts the data, your data that is on your on your disk, and and demands a ransom or money in order to decrypt the data so that you can access the data again. Right. So uh, so in in this case, as a user, you won't be able to access the data because it's encrypted. And only the hacker has uh, has the decryption, right? Uh, another scenario uh, for uh, losing availability at rest is uh, one if, like, let's say, a virus on on your on your machine erased erases the disk, right? Then that the data will not be available anymore, right? Uh, what other example? Let's say, like, for example, oh, in availability in in use. Uh, so we talked about this. Uh, so there are attacks. Um, if you have, a, let's say, a web application where kind of uh, you have data uh, that you allows users to access their data, there is an attack called the denial, a distributed denial of service, DDoS for short. And so, what the hacker does in this scenario is that he will generate malicious traffic, a lot of traffic to that web application, so that legitimate users cannot access uh, the the web application anymore, right? Because because it's it's busy. Uh, handling requests malicious malicious traffic so that's called distrib distributed denial of service uh, or ddos uh, and again other threats are listed in this table uh, so please uh, look at them and document on 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 some of those attacks uh, as well okay so uh, in the second major so the second table we show some protection techniques right how, how do you protect against the attacks that we showed in the previous table so uh, for uh, for data at rest to protect confidentiality uh, uh, one technique is encryption decryption that we mentioned earlier uh, another technique is access control and another technique is we don't think about it very often but it's physical protection so basically if you have a disk put it if you if you are absent for a long time put it in a room close the room lock it so that's physical protection. That no one will, will be able to access the, the data or archive data or tape uh, or anything like that where data is protected. Uh, yeah, confidentiality, in order to protect confidentiality in motion, the technique that we use there is uh, transport encryption decryption. And we, we'll talk later about HTTPS, about TNS, uh, IPsec, uh, all these techniques. Um, and then what other... Um, like how do you protect, for example, integrity in motion, or let's say at rest, integrity at rest. So uh, integrity then, uh, just, just a reminder, integrity is about making sure that uh, changes are authorized, uh, that, uh, that there are integrity rules that are respected. Think about the age example, and then that uh, we can detect uh, unauthorized uh, changes to the data. So, in order to protect integrity at rest, we can use access control, integrity rules, and signed hashes. Right? Uh, 
the one last thing I wanted to, to cover is uh, how do you protect confidentiality in use, right? When we are like your data, the data you are concerned about is kind of in the memory space of a web application, for example, right? Uh, so there are techniques there and uh, we want to go in details because each one of them is uh, kind of a whole presentation by itself. There's a lot of content there. Uh, but uh, one popular one is web apps protections. So if, if your application is a web app, then, then you need to protect against things like uh, SQL injection, um, uh, for example. Uh, and then another protection is to keep software up to date. So when we say keep software up to date, uh, we mean basically that uh, you're, even if you wrote your own program, right? But, uh, but the program will have dependencies, software dependencies, right? For example, you're running your program in Tomcat, for example, or, uh, and then you have Java dependencies, or, uh, or uh, let's say not JS uh, with, uh, with JavaScript dependencies. Uh, any of these packages that you are using in your application might have might have um, uh, might have uh, defects in it, bugs, right? So, so it's very important to keep software up to date. And in the past, many many attacks have been a result of of old software that was not updated by uh, by its owners, right? So, this, and the software contained bugs uh, that uh, that were exploited by attackers, basically. Okay. Okay, so uh, I wanted also to mention two important things when we deal about, uh, with security. The first one is that security is not an afterthought. That's something people who kind of get introduced to security or cybersecurity, uh, this is something that you will hear often if, you're, again, if, you, if you work in this, in this area, that security is not an afterthought. What, what do we mean by that? We mean basically that uh, security is not something that you do at, at the end. It's not something that you develop your software or your solution, and then at the end you say, okay, now how do I secure it? It's something that needs to be done right from the, the beginning, right? Whenever you start an information technology IT project, right, that's when you need to start thinking about security, right? So security should be integrated in the development cycle, in kind of when you develop your application, when you, you know, plan for its deployment, how it's going to be deployed in your environment, et cetera, that's when you, start, you need to start thinking about security. So activities that you can do uh, uh, during the development are security reviews. So security reviews basically is uh, you, ha you have, you have um, uh, the architecture of your solution, the software architecture, right? With maybe uh, with diagrams, uh, architecture diagrams. So, uh, security review consists in sitting with a security expert and to go over over the program, uh, over the solution of, or the architecture and see, uh, you know, uh, identify any security concerns there. Uh, there is another activity uh, called threat modeling, which is basically a security review, but with a uh, little bit more organized, right? Kind of you have to look at specific things in order to identify security issues. Uh, and then you can run tools. So uh, there is a popular tool called static analysis. So static analysis basically will scan your source code and find, find uh, security issues there. And of course, uh, 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 testing, security should be part of testing as well. So this should be security testing. Uh, most, of the, most of the time or, or often, uh, what people who develop software do, they test the software for, uh, you know, is it functional? Is it running? As expected, but they don't do security testing. So that's a very important thing to integrate into uh, testing, and uh, and uh, preferably uh, do penetration testing. So penetration testing is a more advanced uh, testing, uh, security testing technique. Uh, and all these activities that we listed here: security reviews, threat modeling, other activities. Actually, there are other activities as well that we haven't mentioned there. Here, uh, all these activities are. Uh, constitute what we call a secure development life cycle, SDL. So that's something if you are interested in, you can document uh, on as well. So as we mentioned, security should be uh, implemented right from the beginning. And also the second thing is that uh, when your solution is deployed, that's not the end of the journey. You need also to keep validating the, your security posture continuously, right? When the software becomes uh, 
becomes live, or, uh, we, we, or we say the technical term is in production, you still need to keep testing your software security posture. So you do that by uh, running scanning tools, like Nmap, this is Verb Suite, doing penetration testing, sometimes even asking uh, external uh, uh, penetration testers to do, to do the test, that's, that's kind of uh, uh, ideal. Uh, and also by actively scanning your sec security posture with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with tools like antivirus. The technical term is actually uh, uh, host IDS, host, uh, host um, intrusion detection system. Uh, and using uh, firewalls uh, and, uh, and and tools like that that monitor security activity. Okay, so the data protection techniques we talked about them. So we will focus on on uh, on two techniques: cryptography and access control. And again, we, we want to go into details into these techniques because uh, these are kind of classes uh, just by themselves. But uh, but hopefully we'll cover uh, the most important concepts. So first. One is uh, cryptography. That's a technique. And when, what we mean by cryptography is number of techniques. Uh, so encryption, decryption. That's part of cryptography. Hashing, and we'll talk about hashing later. Uh, hash signing, key agreement. And as you can see, that's in in uh, in, uh, in gray because it's not really involved. It's not really used in for data, data protection. Uh, not directly, anyway. Uh, so that, that's why we, we want to cover it. And then random number generation or RNG. Okay, so first, okay. Let's go back. Okay, so first we'll start with uh, encryption. Encryption, decryption, right? So uh, what do we mean by encryption decryption? So encryption decryption, you're probably familiar with it, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but encryption is, is basically transforming some source data, what we call a clear text. So that's the original data, right? Into data that can't be read by an authorized party. So that's what we call cipher text. So encryption is basically transforming a clear text to cipher text so that someone who doesn't know how that, that transformation is done, cannot access your data, right? Because now it's kind of in a different, different form, ciphertext, right? Uh, this transformation uh, usually involves cryptographic key. Let's, let's call it K. Uh, and uh, so there are two, two, um, two types of encryption. There is a symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. So we will not cover asymmetric encryption for lack of time. But symmetric encryption basically is a technique where you use one key to encrypt and decrypt the data. Okay, so uh, the math of symmetric encryption is ciphertext is what you get when you encrypt with a key K, a clear text, right? And then, and then as a user, if you want to have access to your data again, is that you need to decrypt that ciphertext with a key and then you get the clear text again. Uh, okay, how, so how do we use encryption decryption for data confidentiality? Uh, so symmetric encryption is what we use basically for data encryption. We, we don't use asymmetric encryption. Again, that's why we, we will not uh, cover, cover it. But if you are interested, asymmetric encryption is basically where you use a public key and private key, right? And RSA is the most popular uh, algorithm. But again, we will not go there. Uh, and, but the reason we use symmetric encryption is because it's much faster than asymmetric encryption decryption. And the most recommended encryption decryption algorithm is AES-256. Uh, 256 uh, refers to the length of the keys in bits, right? Uh, but also there is also AES-192, where the key is 192 bits long, and AES-128. So there are other variants of AES as well. And AES is used to protect data at rest, uh, but it's also used to protect data in motion, not just at rest, but in motion. And in, when it's used to protect data in motion, it's used within uh, protocols such as TLS. And TLS is basically what, what HTTPS uses, uh, IPsec, SRTP. Right? As SRTP is the protocol that protects uh, media 
packets when you use, for example, WhatsApp and you use that video in Viber, for example, uh, that those tools use SRTP to protect uh, the confidentiality of, of the media data. Okay. Okay, so now if you use AES-256, uh, AES-256 for, uh, for, uh, to, to encrypt data so that you protect the confidentiality of your data, uh, first, first consideration is that you need to use a 256 bits key that is very, very hard to guess because it's very, it's very easy to guess then the hacker can guess the key and then, and then, uh, and then access your encrypted data. Right. So, in order to generate a key to 56 bits, we use what we call the key. Okay. So, this is the key. So, in order to generate a key, you, we use a technique called random number generation. So, these are tools, RNG, that allow to generate uh, a key. Uh, but also, a key can be generated from a password. But, uh, using techniques such as PPKDF2, uh, we won't go uh, in details into that, but if you're interested, please check PBK, uh, PBK, PBKDF2. Uh, so the key must be, okay, now that we have encrypted our clear text with a key, we need to protect the key, right? So how do we protect the key? Do we protect it? Do we encrypt it? So if we encrypt that key, then how do we protect the encryption key that encrypts the key, right? So we, we need some, some way to protect the key. So what, uh, what uh, we use for that purpose is, uh, is, uh, uh, it, uh, is a system called, called KMS, a key management system. So that this is kind of a, a software, uh, sorry, uh, computing equipment that is purposely designed to protect keys. Uh, or also we can protect keys in HSMs, hardware security modules, the same thing. It's kind of, this is like a module that you can like plug to your server or your computer in order to, to store the keys, right? So that they are protected uh, there. Uh, but um, uh, in, in, uh, if we don't have a KMS and the HSM, because these are equipment can be expensive, keys can be also stored on disk but they need, kind of they need to be protected. For example, like file system uh, protection, right? No one can has has access to that the file that where the keys is uh, is stored. Uh, uh, so techniques like that can be uh, uh, can be effective in in some instances. Uh, okay, and then one thing to note is that encryption doesn't provide integrity. I think something that people are sometimes confused about when you encrypt the data. Uh, yeah, it can't be seen by a hacker. But it doesn't provide, uh, it doesn't protect against integrity. So if an attacker changes an encrypted text, th there is no direct way to detect that uh, that uh, that change to the data, even if it's encrypted, right? Okay. Now, next uh, technique, a cryptographic technique, it's called hashing. So what is hashing? Hashing basically is a technique that maps a piece of data of any length to a representation of of a fixed length representation, right? So, uh, for example, 512 bits, right? So that representation is called the hash or a fingerprint. And the most, uh, the most popular uh, algorithm for hashing is called SHA-2. So let's give an example. So uh, this is an example on, on Mac uh, using a tool called SHA-SUM. Uh, there, there are also other tools that you can use for, uh, for, uh, for hashing, like OpenSSL. But then, let's see at this example. So in this example, for example, we, uh, we, we, we want to compute the hash of number one, right? As, and as you can see, this is like in, in hex, this is like 512, sorry, 256 in this case, 256 bits hash of the number one. As you can see, like from number of one digit, we generate the representation. So however, the, the length of the, the data the hash will always result in this case in a 256 bits representation. That's and that's called the hash or fingerprint. And as you can see, the second line is echo uh, is uh, the fingerprint of or the hash, the hash of two of number two. Same thing. You see that there is a there is a representation 256 representation of it, right? And as you, if you compare the two hashes, you will see that they are completely different. So someone cannot guess. The hash of two look just to look by looking at the hash of one, right? And that's a good property of, of hashes. 
So uh, SHA-2, the, this algorithm, makes it very hard to find two pieces of data that hash to the same value. That, this is a very important property in cryptography. Okay, so um, do, can, uh, can we use hashing for data integrity? So the idea here is that you have some data and then you calculate the hash so that if someone changes the data, then, then you can see that the hash doesn't match anymore. Like the, the hash of the, or the fingerprint of the new data doesn't match the original data. But this is not enough because, because a hacker can, can change the data and change the hash as well. Right. So uh, in order to use hashing for, for data integrity, we need, we need to use a technique called signed hashes. So we present this signed hashes. So basically signed hash, what signed hashes is, is that you, we still hash the data where we get a representation and then, uh, and, and then we, uh, we sign the hash. So how do we sign the hash? It's basically by, we sign with, with a key, right? So we apply, uh, a cryptographic operation. Uh, uh, so HMAC is is uh, is, is one one sign hash signing technique. There are others, but HMAC is probably the most uh, popular. So as you can see, the signed hash in, in this case is that we hash the data, right, and then look at the equation, and then we calculate the HMAC uh, using the key K of the hashed data. Now, if the hacker changes the data, right. Since he doesn't have the key, because the key needs to be uh, kept uh, protected, um, he won't be able to generate new, the new signed hash for, for, the, for the, the exchanged data, right? Okay, so now look at, uh, we look at an example of protect, how we protect data in motion with symmetric encryption and HMAC. And uh, so symmetric encryption, as we have seen, protects uh, confidentiality, whereas HMAC protects uh, uh, integrity, right? So in this scenario, we, we see two uh, systems, right? Or two machines, one, the origin machine and the destination machine. And then they have a network connection between them. Uh, and then we want, the origin machine wants to send secret data to the destination, right? And so the data will go over the network, over the internet, uh, in the network connection. So we want to have a way to secure that data. Uh, so, so the data, uh, the original data needs to be, uh, as you see, as you know, in networking, it needs to be kind of, we can't, we, it can't be sent in, in bulk in one, in one shot. It has to be divided into, Okay, into segments of data, right? And as you can see now, like we have like multiple segments of the data. The, data, the original data is segmented, segment one, segment I, segment N, and all the segments. So this is basically just di di dividing the, the original data into, into uh, packets, if you will, that will be sent over the network. And as you can see, the way we can do that is that if we send, for example, segment I of the data, we encrypt it with key uh, K1, right? And then we calculate the HMAC of that segment using the key K2, right? And what and we send both things, uh, both things, the encrypted segment and also the HMAC of that segment, segment together. So now that at the destination, since the destination also has key one, K1 and K2, they will be able to uh, they, they will be able to decrypt. The segment I and also check the integrity of that segment using HMAC, right? Okay, and then the next thing is random number generation. So number number generation is what we use to um, uh, to generate cryptographic keys, right? Uh, uh, so the so and so RNG is kind of basically a tool or technique that generates a sequence of numbers, uh, like sh should be random. Uh, but uh, be aware that most many programming languages use RNGs that are kind of predictable. So an attacker can actually predict what is the next, next number that will be generated, right? So, uh, so in, in applications where we need to protect data with, with keys, we need to use a special RNG called CSP RNG, cryptographically secure pseudo RNG. Because these RNGs are are um, are uh, 
uh, like guaranteed to generate numbers that are that are very very hard to to guess. Okay, uh, access control. So access control is another technique that we mentioned to protect uh, data. Uh, so access control is about basically about verifying who can access this system or a solution and what it can it can do once it has access to the system. So uh, it involves two things. First, verifying the identity of the entity. That's what we call authentication. And then that verifying that that identity can do the, an operation that it requires. Let's say a system supports like 10 operations, uh, but one user can only do three, is authorized only to do three operations in that system, right? So that's called authorization. So authentication, first, uh, authentication is uh, the most uh, known or Popular technique is basically username and password. So as you know, the, the, the problem with password is that uh, uh, if, if you use a complex password, then it's very, they are very hard to remember. And if we use like a simple one, then, then the hacker can guess the password. So the recommendation here is to use a passphrase, basically a phrase that is kind of easy to remember, but difficult for someone to, to guess, right? But, and uh, so use special characters, right? But for example, in this case, an example, uh, it's a sentence, so uh, it's easy to remember, but someone cannot, cannot uh, guess. And it's long, it contains special characters and numbers. Another, another problem with uh, password is, uh, is that uh, uh, password reuse. If you are, you're, you're using 100 applications, then, then users are tempted to use the same password again and again. So I will skip, for lack of time, again, that's the authentication. Uh, authorization, again, is once you have access to the system, the system needs to be ensure that you as a user, you are authenticated, but you can only access uh, operations that you are authorized to, to access. So uh, I will jump to, to privacy, introduction to privacy here. So we mentioned like the three goals of uh, data protection, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So. Pro Privacy is another one, very important one. So basically, privacy is involved whenever uh, an organization manages personal data of human users, right? We're not talking about machines, or but human users. So uh, uh, what, what type of organization uh, manages personal data? So these are banks. They manage the information, the personal information of their clients, hospitals, of their patients, universities, students, enterprises their employees information and then, but also applications like Google, Facebook, they have, they have information about their users. So privacy aspects are involved there. Uh, examples of personal data, first and last name, date of birth, address, health information, credit card number, bank account number, national identity number, passport number, these are all considered as personal data. But uh, there are a subset of personal data that is very, very important that we care about is called uh, Personally Identifiable Information, or PII. Uh, so that's a um, uh, top goal of privacy. So uh, what are the questions raised by privacy? First, uh, well, again, when you, as a user, as a human user, you give your information to some organization and it needs to manage it. The first question is, how will the personal data be protected, right? Uh, again, this, this brings us back to the CII requirements or CII course. And then also, how are the protection validated, verified? Right. So this is kind of like relates to CIA. But uh, but uh, what on top of that, what privacy brings is that uh, questions like is the personal data only accessed by those who need access to it? Right. For example, if you if you uh, when you use your interior inf personal information in uh, let's say in uh, in Facebook, right? You is is the whole Facebook has access to your information or only the employees who need that access? Uh, the, third, the third question is how long is the personal data stored, right? Like for example, let's say you, you, want, you don't want to, uh, you want to unsubscribe from cloud service, right? Uh, what, what will that company do with your personal, will, will it also delete your information or will keep it for, uh, for a long time? Uh, another question raised by privacy is the personal data shared with other organizations. Uh, you see this a lot in marketing, for example, that your personal data can be shared with, uh, with others. And then uh, control of the data. As a user, as a human user, are you in control of your own personal data in, in, the, in the organization system? Like, can you change information? Can you delete information? Questions like that. 
And uh, this is the last slide. Um, so, uh, uh, so in order to protect uh, the data, uh, we, we, we can use the CIA protection techniques that we have seen, like access control, encryption, cryptography, uh, you know, all, all these uh, protections can be used. Uh, but also on top of that, you need to implement processes such as kind of, you need to, for example, remove users when they become inactive. If you unsubscribe from the service, that, then, then the organization has to, needs to have a process in place to remove those users. And then you need legal agreements, legal agreements that uh, will tell uh, that, uh, for example, th this is what we do with your users, right? We, with your information, we don't share it, things like that. And, and then uh, as you have, might have noticed, sometimes when you subscribe to a service, you need to accept that disclaimer. Uh, the most uh, popular standard in privacy is called GDPR. It's a Europe, European standard uh, that, uh, you know, many companies, that two businesses need to comply with. For example, and it's a European standard, and for example, uh, American companies and Chinese companies when they do business in Europe, they have to comply with, uh, with GDPR most of the time. Otherwise, they're not authorized to, to, uh, to work in, in, those, uh, in, in Europe. Um, and this is the last slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Murad, for keeping the presentation to the allocated time. And thank you for the nice presentation. You gave a very good uh, introduction to the topic. And uh, it's clear from the number of questions that we have. One uh, question that is asked in different ways, but repeated many times, is the impact of AI on uh, security. Uh, very good question. So the, the, the biggest impact uh, of AI on security is uh, is privacy uh, because a a AI you need to use a large amount of data to uh, for machine learning for example or building models uh, or training uh, and those data might might have might have personal information in, in them so how how do you ensure that that personal information is, is adequately protected. Uh, uh, you know, and and uh, uh, obeys all the kind of the requirements that we have that we have seen, right? Uh, who who has access to that information, right? Um, so one the common technique that is used there is called anonymization. So basically, before using the data, the personal data is replaced with with some token, right? So that uh, so that the personal data is no longer there. Uh, it's uh, there, there is some some some. Uh, string that will replace the person, for example, the date of birth, right, will be replaced with, uh, or a first name, last name, with, uh, with a unique token. Uh, so that's a technique, but, uh, but other techniques also can be used, such as, for example, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, uh, access control, like uh, those who have access to those data are, are uh, only those who really, really need that access, right, and no one else. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question, I think you already mentioned it in the presentation, but just to refresh, uh, what are the uh, three pillars of CIA? The CIA is, uh, so yes. C, C stands for confidentiality, which, which, is, uh, which is to ensure that data can only be seen or viewed by those who, uh, who have, who, uh, have uh, been uh, given access to them. Right, that's confidentiality. Second one is integrity. So integrity basically uh, to, uh, is to ensure that the data can only be changed in authorized ways. Right. So it can it cannot be changed by those who can't change it. It cannot be changed in a way that make it inconsistent. Uh, like think of for example database. Right. Like uh, uh, if you have constraints, I don't remember the term that is used in database. But uh, but uh, some changes to the data need to be consistent, right? Uh, uh, you know, like for example, like if, 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 if you have a database that contains the weight of, uh, uh, I, I don't know, like um, the weight of fruits, for example, right? Then, then, or then, then the weight has to be kind of in a certain range that is kind of realistic, right? An apple cannot be a hundred kilograms, for example. So, uh, so that, that's integrity of the data. And also integrity, one uh, important aspect is to ensure that, uh, that if the data is changed maliciously by, by, by a hacker, that can be uh, detected. And then the last one, uh, the last uh, the, the 
CIA, in C the, the last letter in CIA, uh, availability, that refers to the ability to, to always have the data accessible. When as, as a user, if you use a system, right, uh, where your data, where data is stored, not necessarily your data, but uh, access to some data in the system, um, how do we ensure that the data is always accessible? Again, the, the, an example that I gave is, for example, uh, uh, like uh, if your data is stored, for example, on disk and the disk crashes, right? Then the data is lost, right? If the disk is a uh, phase for some reason, right? Uh, so our protection techniques there is to make regular backups, right? And, uh, uh, and another example is ransomware, right? Uh, th those are attacks that encrypted data on disk. It's, they are still on disk, but they are encrypted with a key that only the hacker has, right? Uh, and that happened a lot in the last, last years. Uh, in, in, even in big companies, because companies don't do backup on backups on a regular basis, right? So you kind of you have to archive the data, store that in a separate separate system, so that even if the data is compromised, uh, it it can be recovered from uh, from the backup. Thank you, Dr. Murad. Uh, someone asked, I think more than once, what are, what is or are the best solution for protecting? data in decentralized data center? Uh, it's, it's basically the same techniques. It doesn't matter if it's centralized or decentralized. Uh, so uh, the, so um, uh, the two techniques that I can think of are crypto cryptographic protections, in encryption, uh, right? Um, and then the second one is, uh, is um, uh, access control. Right, Make basically, basically whoever access the system needs to be first authenticated. Uh, you know, uh, uh, check if, if if that entity is authorized to to do uh, to, to, to you know to, to, to do whatever it is requested. So these are the kind of direct techniques to protect against uh, to protect uh, to protect data in in uh, in uh, centralized or decentralized uh, contexts. Uh, uh, and there are indirect techniques, like for example, as we mentioned, like uh, you know, run, running antivirus, make sure that there is no 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 virus or malicious software running on your system. Uh, you know, uh, 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 monitor the traffic with uh, firewalls or uh, or uh, uh, ideas, uh, intrusion detection systems. Please uh, uh, keep your keep yourself muted thank you dr murad for the uh, answer uh, uh, there were a number of questions about uh, around uh, iot and i guess the question are because in the iot you have devices with limited uh, basically uh, resources limited memory limited uh, computational uh, so what kind of technique, because the old technique of security cannot be used uh, with these devices? Dr. Morad, you are muted. You are still muted, Dr. Morad. Okay, okay. now you are unmuted. Unmuted, but, but uh, okay, unmuted, sorry. Uh, yes, so uh, yeah, you, you are uh, absolutely right. So the, the, the IoT in the world of IoT, uh, it's, uh, we have, basically we have the same, um, uh, the, the same problems as we have as, as any other computing system, right? Even servers, but what, what is different with IoT is limited resources, right? Uh, so in, in that case, uh, the same techniques that I mentioned that are listed for protecting da data are applicable. It's just that they have to be adap adapted because uh, in IoT context, uh, kind of you, you don't have as many computing resources. Power can be can be uh, can be a challenge. Uh, you know, electric just powering the device can be a challenge. So the same techniques are are um, are, are are used, but uh, but they have been adapted. Like for example, cryptography. Uh, uh, they, they use uh, like um, uh, uh, techniques that, that that require less less computation, for example, uh, or or less space. There is a, a, a technique called uh, elliptic curve cryptography that that requires less less uh, like keys are are shorter. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so that, that's that's kind of that, that's the uh, and and another another also another uh, challenge with IoT is uh, uh, is is configuration. When you have like thousands of devices, uh, it's tempting to all give to give them to give all of them like the same the same password. If you want to manage that uh, that IoT device, uh, you know, and then you want you want to have like uh, uh, you know uh, 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 configure a password. On, on, on that device so that you can manage it remotely, for example. It's tempting to give the same password to all your, your IoT devices, and they can be thousands of ten thousands of them, right? So how do you how do you uh, ensure that you can kind of you have different credentials for or different passwords for each one of those devices, IoT devices, even if you have many, many of them and you can't do it manually, right? So it's, again, th th those are kind of uh, problems that are that are specific to IoT, just because they are first they are they can be thousands or tens of thousands of them, and second they are limited in in resources and memory. But basically, the techniques are the same. Uh, it's just again they just need to be adapted to the context of IoT. Thank you for the detailed answer. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a curious question. Uh, I think two people asked it. Saying, are there any technique used to protect data, maybe in private companies, and I think they are referring to your experience, or military organization, for example, that are not really known or available in the literature? Uh, that, that, so the question that are not really known, right? Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, the, 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 the answer is... Uh, Maybe, <laughs> but but in general, in general, it's a bad idea uh, because in uh, in uh, oh, especially in crypto in cryptography, right? Encryption and decryption techniques. Uh, so uh, there are two ways you can protect the data. You can you can have an algorithm that is secret, right? Or you can have like a secret algorithm for encrypting data or protecting data. The second option is to have like a, a defined algorithm. Right, but what what is secret is the key, right? The encryption key, for example. So most authors actually favor the second option because you say you say if you make the algorithm public, right, then everyone can review it. Can everyone can see if it's really no, 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 Dr. Molad. I think what they meant by the question, yeah. For example, are there companies that they develop their own technique and they don't publish it? Uh, I, I haven't. I haven't seen it again. It, it can be done, but in general, I think it's a bad idea because uh, because because they rely on the fact that the technique will will remain secret, and and that assumption is has proved wrong in the past, right? If you kind of invent a secret secret algorithm and want to keep it secret, right? It always leaks out. It always like becomes public, uh, yes. you know, uh, somewhere. When, uh... Uh, one last question because we are running of time. For the audience, of course, uh, Dr. Morad is available. You can always uh, get in touch with him yes. and uh, you can get more detail about uh, your question. Uh, general question for uh, as a lay layman, how do I know that my device is protected or not? Uh, that's that's a good question. So uh, your device, so for example, your your laptop, uh, for for example, or your phone, right? So so one personal recommend one recommendation there is always keep keep it up to date. Uh, you know, up, update. Uh, sometimes you get a notification on your device saying like uh, 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 you, we have the latest version of this software, right? Can you so always. Always accept those those changes, uh, on, either on your phone or on your uh, on, on your personal device, laptop or uh, or tablet, uh, because uh, be, because again, uh, outdated uh, software is is has been source of of uh, uh, many many of the attacks in the past, right? Because uh, like as the software. Uh, yeah, and including commercial software or, or open source uh, freeware, right? Uh, you know, uh, hackers discover uh, vulnerabilities or bugs all the time. Uh, so, and, and hackers have, have time to kind of to build attacks or ways to, to uh, so, uh, so it's a good idea to upgrade because when you upgrade your, your software, you, you get all the protections or the bug, bug fixes for that software. Uh, uh, in uh, and then there is a you know good you know personal uh, 
personal uh, things that don't depend on the software or your device. It depends on the user, right? Like for example, making backups from time to time, right? Making backup on maybe on separate disk or cloud storage, uh, you know, have, have a very strong password. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a good, also good practice to have antivirus on, on, on your device. Uh, th things like that, that uh, th this is again for personal security, but for an enterprise security, one good one good recommendation is to, to have to have monitoring uh, tools, right? Like uh, I mentioned, some of them like uh, NISIS or NMAP. These are tools basically that monitor your system and uh, your your servers, and uh, and uh, you know uh, alert you if there is anything that needs to that needs attention, right? Like um, yeah, yeah, uh, and one yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Murad. Uh, if it is possible, we can give your email through chat. Actually, already uh, it has been given because there are many questions actually that okay. I could not get to. I try to choose the question that were very general, where many people basically ask them. But I know, for example, uh, Dr. Amir asked three very specific questions. I think it's a very good idea to get in touch with uh, Dr. Murad. Again, yeah. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Murad for his time and for the uh, nice presentation. And I like to thank everyone who attended and uh, participated in one way or another. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Judy and Dr. Faiz. And I give the, them the decision to if they want to say anything. Hiddin or Faiz. شكرا اخ سعد avec cette brillante présentation on n'a rien à dire de plus on est dans les temps on respecte les gens les gens nous respectent et j'insiste beaucoup et je demande pour les prochains webinaires parfois il faut être un peu plus strict la prochaine fois que quelqu'un active le son pendant la conférence on va l'exclure définitivement de tous les webinaires. On n'arrive on, on, on même pas à... Il y a des gens, j'ai arrêté le son pendant une dizaine de fois, et, 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 et quand même le son il est toujours activé. Essayez d'être de, de, en mode mute automatiquement quand vous rentrez. C'est simple et on vous laisse le choix de poser les questions euh, et, et le président euh, récupère l'essentiel des questions. On vous donne l'adresse email de l'intervenant si vous pouvez continuer à poser des questions euh, euh, par email euh, à l'intervenant. Shukran Arsad. Rien à rajouter. Yatiksaha, M. Sherfaoui. C'était une excellente présentation et on vous donne rendez-vous à tous, Inch'Allah, la semaine prochaine. Voilà. Merci All beaucoup. All right. Barakallahu fikim jamian. Je vais mettre sur le chat pour euh, laisser quelques secondes pour la copier et puis euh, merci beaucoup. Oui, la, la meilleure façon de, or the best way to reach out to me is uh, through LinkedIn. Just my first name and last name. But please refer to, the, to this webinar so I know that uh, you are uh, reaching out to me uh, because you attended the webinar. I would be happy to help uh, if we need questions, uh, anything. Yeah. And that comes to house. Salam alaikum. Salam and I bear cake, Dr. Mullah. Salam, Mashallah. Salam, Mashallah.